all the way back there in the back. Uh, welcome, thank you for coming to the Sigma Xi Distinguished Lecture Series, a series of two, today and tomorrow. Um, this is a sponsored series, or a, a lecture series that's sponsored by Sigma Xi, and you get a grant from the national organization, and then some of the funding for this is provided by local chapter dues from our Sigma Xi members. So thank you, all the Sigma Xi members in the audience. Um, today we're going to hear a talk um, by Dr. Rick Kavitek, and he is a professor in the Division of Science and Environmental Policy at California State University, Monterey Bay, so out on the Pacific Coast, and he directs the Seafloor Mapping Lab there. He started out with a bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of Michigan, got a master's degree um, from Moss Landing, and his PhD from the University of Washington. And he researches, he's really a benthic ecologist, and he researches what's going on there on the bottom of the sea. And I learned this evening that one of the things that motivates him is getting a good spatial data set so that you can actually do ecology under the water in the same way that land ecologists can do ecology on land, with that same kind of resolution. So, Rick? It's all yours. Great. Well, thank you. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here in uh, St. Peter. It actually feels like coming home. I grew up in Michigan, spent my first 25 years there, so this really feels much more like my, my native environment. Um, but I'm going to take you in a different place entirely today. Uh, a lot of it's going to be underwater, and, but what I want to focus on is sort of my own experience uh, in science uh, in particular, but in life in general, about how you know, you first run into something that just seems impossible. It's kind of like, you've got to be kidding. But then, using lateral thinking, uh, you, you finally get to the, aha, there really is a solution here. And this approach, um, at least for me, has sort of brought hope to, uh, to our oceans using insight and innovation. That's really going to be the theme of my talk, but it's going to be my own little personal crusade and trajectory that I'm going to focus uh, on as we go through here. And before I got into science, um, I was actually making topological puzzles, which I uh, started developing when I was working on my master's in early childhood development. I was a kindergarten teacher. And uh, these puzzles, I really like. Um, I designed them and built them. The, the thing kind of took off. I uh, was just making it for my students, and my parents said, God, you ought to make these for your for sale. And I tried it and actually uh, took off. And I ended up selling them all over the world. But what I liked about them uh, was that they're sort of engineered aha moments because the obvious solution doesn't work and it really requires lateral thinking on um, how, to, to how to solve these puzzles. Um, and it, it, it led to the, uh, from the you got to be kidding, uh, first impression to, okay, this is how you really have to solve this. And my own next aha moment uh, from that occurred to me when I was walking through the Steinhardt Aquarium in the San Francisco Academy of Sciences. And I came across the Jinsu exhibit. This is a piece of equipment that Sylvia Earle, a famed oceanographer, used to explore the deep sea. And it just stopped me in my tracks. And I just said to myself, you know, I'd rather be doing that. Um, and so the next day, uh, I went and found Moss Landing Marine Labs in the coast of California, right in the middle of Monterey Bay and enrolled as a graduate student there, started working in the benthic ecology lab. And there I was using traditional methods of interacting with the ocean floor, the benthic ecology there. Um, and in short, I was sort of looking at the world through a scuba mask. And I was making on the average of between 300 and 500 dives a year, and I was working with uh, gray whales because they're bottom feeders. They make their living by taking bites out of the seafloor and, and straining the mud out. I was looking at the disturbance and the recovery caused by these animals. I was doing a similar thing with walrus up in the barrier of the Chukchi Sea in the high Arctic. Uh, also bottom feeders, uh, uh, sucking clams out of the bottom and, and disturbing the bottom. Uh, they're feisty animals. It led to some fairly close encounters, but uh, we survived them all. Um, and then also uh, ice scour disturbance. Uh, ice scour, that is icebergs coming in, hitting the seafloor is the major form of disturbance in uh, polar latitudes. And I did a lot of work there uh, looking at the physical disturbance and the biological recovery uh, of, of that disturbance. Uh, again, it was all done with diving. 
But these traditional methods using quadrants and scuba diving and grabs, they're all plagued by geospatial problems of scale and position. Um, and for me, as I said, I was looking at everything through a scuba mask, and I could see that square meter in front of me, but I really had no idea how representative that square meter was of a larger landscape, or if I was even looking in the right place. Um, and so what I wanted was something that would do uh, for benthic ecology what aerial photography, uh, or just getting up on top of a hill had done for terrestrial ecology, that big, broad scale view of what's out there. Um, and so for me, my first big uh, advance was the use of side scan sonar, which is an acoustic device that uh, produces a, a picture of the, of the sea floor. And that was the first time I could see great whale feeding pits all over the ocean floor. Before I dived down, I could find one like that, and I could see it. But now with side scan, I could see the whole floor of the bay I was working in with these great whale feeding pits all over them. And I could see where in the bay they were feeding and where they weren't. I could answer a lot of ecological questions. I said, man, I've got to get myself one of these. But they were really expensive. Like, where do you get a side scan sonar system? They're 85,000 bucks. Well, that uh, led to, you know, again, so often um, good luck comes from uh, planning and meeting opportunity. And my next opportunity occurred uh, just, this is San Francisco Bay right here. Uh, and Stinson Beach, a well known resort, is right up there. And a large landslide occurred uh, during an earthquake that took out Highway 1 along the coast, right along here. And that highway connected Stinson Beach, which is a place where a lot of really wealthy, politically well-connected people live, connected that location with San Francisco. That's how they would come to and from the city. They wanted this road open. Right offshore is the National Marine Sanctuary, which has uh, very uh, strict regulations about dumping anything in its waters and pushing dirt from road construction into the waters was not something that you could do. Um, and so uh, Caltrans, California's uh, transportation agency, had engaged us to begin looking at the ecology just offshore of this slide to get a sense of what the damage might be as they reconstructed it. And at that point, uh, it was taking a long time. The people living in Simpson Beach started calling the governor's office and said, hey, you got to get this road open. Let's go. So Caltrans was getting pretty nervous. They called me in and said, Rick, what can you do to help us here? we really got to get this going. The sanctuary doesn't want stuff in. I said, look, if you guys buy me a side scan sonar system, I can track exactly what's going to happen to your offshore environment as that sediment gets moved in. It took me 15 minutes. I said, I can produce a map showing the whole toe of the slide. We can see just what the impact is, where there is, where there is one, et cetera. They said, great, here's your 85 grand. You can go buy your side scan sonar. I immediately took the side scan sonar up to the North Pole. Uh, <laughs> of course, I did the work for Caltrans, but what I really wanted to see was what was going on with ice scours up to the poles. And there, we loaded it onto um, the Inuit boat. I was working with the Eskimos up there. And we went out, and for the first time, we ran the side scan. And we could see these huge ice scours on the seafloor. They were spectacular. And we could pick the locations I wanted to sample. Because what I wanted to see was what the disturbance was inside of the scour versus outside. So I could sample inside and outside of the scours. Um, so we could, now we could take the divers out, and we could go down and look exactly where we wanted. More importantly, I could take these long side scan strips like that, and I could paste them together, and now I could see the whole landscape for the first time. And these features right here, you could fit a 747 into this scour here. Some of these things were two miles long, they were 100 or more meters wide, just spectacular. And I could go back year after year, and I could see where new ones had formed, I could see where old ones were changing and becoming, uh, uh, beginning to recover physically. Um, and it just completely changed how I could do benthic ecology. And I could go and I could pick all my sampling sites. I could pick them inside and outside. Um, and so this looks like, man, this is going to be great. I was going to be able to do so much. Uh, but it also came along with my next uh, you got to be kidding moment. Because I had spent one day, I did 18 dives. I put in earth anchors uh, on the seafloor. The augers that I screwed in, I tied ropes to them and put buoys up floating on the surface because I was going to be there for three weeks. My plan was to go out each day for three weeks and visit each one of these stations and do all the sampling that I needed to do. Well, on the last dive of the day, I come up to go to crawl in my zodiac. 
only to find this huge ice flow coming in and ripped out every single one of those buoys. And it's like, okay, we need to come up with a new solution here. This one is not working. And that's where differential GPS came in. So I, could, I found out that I could set up my own differential base station with a radio transmitter, transmitter in a known location. And then as long as I had a GPS receiver that could receive those corrections, I could now visit every single one of these sites without having to have a buoy on at all. My earth anchors were on the ground, were screwed in the bottom. I could just take the boat out with the GPS, get over one of those spots, jump down with a rope, tie the boat off to it, get the work done, and then come up. So it worked great. I was able to get a lot of work done. So that transformed my work in the poles. But meanwhile, back at Moss Landing, we had a problem with our National Estuary uh, Research Reserve, the Elkhorn Slough uh, uh, Reserve. It was under siege from a number of environmental assaults. And this is the opening of the slough right there. They had opened the mouth of the slough, they cut the mouth open, and it exposed it to uh, full tidal star flushing. And what was happening was uh, we were getting uh, a lot of tidal erosion. Uh, breach levees, washed out tide gates, oops, um, and a lot of bank erosion and salt mark well, salt, salt mark loss. Uh, these are 5,000 year old salt marshes uh, that were just getting eroded away by all this tidal scour. And the way we keep track of it, traditionally, is I get a whole bunch of graduate students to go out there and we literally measure the, uh, the width of the bank. You can see this big block that's halved <laughs> off. And then we go back over time, every six months, go out and we make those same transect measurements to get an idea of how fast it was eroded. Okay, um, but in the 90s, we sort of stepped it up a notch. Uh, we started measuring the transects of the slough, so the profiles along the slough, using single beam uh, bathymetry. Uh, it was still sort of the hard way, but we were able to quantify uh, both the channel erosion and the bank erosion using these techniques. And then offshore, ecosystem-based management was sort of this new idea but nobody really knew what it was. It was mandated. Uh, there were state and federal laws saying you had to do it. Uh, in fact, in 1996, beginning with uh, a ratification of the Sustainable Fisheries Amendment to the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, it required uh, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to adopt um, an essential fish habitat approach, an ecosystem-based approach, uh, to managing our fisheries. And at the state level in California, a big fisheries state, um, they also uh, were uh, pressed in 1998 with the passage of the Marine Life Management Act to adopt an ecosystem-based management approach. And really what that meant was linking species distribution with abundance, um, or their, their distribution of abundance to habitat, linking species to where they are found. Something we traditionally do in the uh, terrestrial ecology, but it's always been challenging to do in the marine realm. But the problem we had then were the quality of the maps at the time in order to do this. The best that we had were a set of maps that were produced in 1985 that were um, used the best available data we had, but they were only at 1 to 250,000 scale. So they were very, very coarse. Uh, they were more like a habitat probability map than real habitat maps. And so I wanted to take the side scan sonar and start producing real habitat maps that show um, the differences in seafloor texture and bottom type at the same scale that the biology was interacting with the ocean. So at scales of sort of meter level scales, because that's the scale that a fish is going to be interacting with its habitat at. And here you can see in the side scan image uh, where bedrock is, gravel, fine sediment is a light color, uh, boulder fields over here. So with side scan, you could really begin to see the detail in the habitat. And with that, now we can start to link species and, and uh, in their habitat uh, at appropriate scales. And so the pitch I've started to make to the state was imagine what you could do with this kind of data if you had it for all of state waters. But we did have a problem in California. Uh, yeah. Our kelp forest, and if you try and drag a side scan of towfish to an area like this with kelp, this is what the fish looks like when you pull it out of the water. It's not effective. So a little bit of a problem. We tried to solve it by taking one of my old windsurfers, 
hung the uh, towfish below it, and then put these kelp deflection bars on it. We could actually drag that through the kelp. It worked fairly well, but it was pretty labor intensive. All right. So we're beginning to see that we needed some better maps of the ocean, but there were challenges to getting it. Um, and then in the 90s, some really good things started to happen very quickly that enabled um, for the, the, the transition that I was hoping for. First, at our campus, um, we opened up uh, in uh, 1994 and 95, and we really decided to emphasize um, spatial, uh, geospatial technology as a core part of our curriculum. Um, we used uh, acoustic remote sensing, GIS, GPS, all the things that you needed to get place-based data emerged from different sources. And we trained the students in that. Uh, the other thing that happened was a revolution, uh, revolutionization of the technology we used to map the seafloor. Traditionally, seafloor maps were created with single beam uh, sonar. It's where a vessel uh, drove across the surface of the ocean, followed these transect lines, and it would send a single pencil beam of sound to the bottom and back up, and it could measure the depth very accurately and directly under the boat. And so you'd end up with a track of high resolution data below it, but you didn't know anything about what was on either side of it. Um, this presents a problem uh, if you're transiting with a boat like I was in the Bering Sea uh, back in the, in the 90s, um, and the maps, all the charts, are based on this sort of data. Uh, we were cruising along at about 10 knots, about a mile and a half from shore in the Bering Sea, and we're down in the galley eating dinner, getting ready to go diving again, when all of a sudden this terrific noise, this big lurch, the boat lifted up, turned on its side almost, everyone got knocked to the deck, like, and the boat just came to a dead stop. It's like, what in the world happened? And we all ran out on deck, we were still a mile and a half offshore, the boat was stopped dead in the water, um, the captain was revving the engines, the boat wouldn't move, the crew had taken depth soundings off of both rails, and it was in 150 feet of water. What's going on here? So I put on my diving suit, went underneath the boat, and we had struck a granite pinnacle head on. In fact, it was a dual pinnacle, there were two little peaks. The boat had hit it head on, and the boat was sitting on its keel right on top of it. If we had been 10 feet to either side, we would have missed it entirely. If we had been 5 feet to either side, it would have just ripped the bottom out of the boat. Finally, the tide came up a little bit, we were able to get it off, we went back to Nome, We've done a bit of damage, but we didn't sink. And that was because now, with multi-beam bathymetry, which is depicted here, you get a full swath of the seafloor that you can map at. This, the sonar actually looks out to either side of the boat and you cover it completely. And what we had hit was a pinnacle that had been completely missed by the previous surveyors because of the technology they were using. And so now, with the advent of multi-beam sonar, we can get comprehensive mapping of the entire seafloor. And that transformed our view of the ocean floor completely. This is a data set that Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute collected uh, um, in deep water, the Monterey Canyon, in San Francisco Bay, the USGS uh, collected uh, imagery of the sea floor there showing bed forms they simply didn't know existed at all. So it's really a transformation um, of our ability to, to visualize the ocean. And so that was a real wow moment. But then we went from that to multi-beam cost. How much? The side scan sonar I thought was expensive, 85,000 bucks, to set up a multi-beam system here well over a million dollars. So it's, it's a little pricey. I needed money again. All right. So back in California, the Marine Life Management Act um, is now requiring an ecosystem approach to be taken. Um, and in 1998, sort of preparation for doing that, I got a small contract from the Department of Fish and Game to evaluate all the available data for the habitat um, uh, characterization that would be needed to really implement an ecosystem-based approach to habitat management. Um, and also to do a comprehensive uh, review of technology that could be used to actually produce the sort of data you needed. So I thought, okay, here's an opportunity where I could really set my ducks in a row, set the stage for the kind of tools I would need if the money ever happened to become available. And so we did those two things for them. And the idea was I wanted to convince them 
that this wasn't what they needed, because that's all we had in California at the time were these nautical charts, but that we actually needed data that looked like that to show the seafloor, where you could see where the rocks were, where the sediment was, and the differences in the character. But I needed the money to do it. Okay, so in 1999, that's um, where I, I got the first major support uh, to make this happen. Uh, first of all, I had written a grant to the Department of Defense uh, to get a new vessel and to get a very modest uh, sonar system that I might use. But at that same time, I got a call from Fish and Game. Um, and they said, Rick, we, we need your help. I got a problem. I said, what's your problem? I said, well, we got a million bucks and I've got to spend it by tomorrow. Can you help me? <laughs> I was ready for it. I said, uh, yeah, I'll call you in the morning. So I got to have a budget by tomorrow. Can you get it? Yep, get it. So the next day, uh, I got the budget to them. Shortly thereafter, we got our multi-beam system. We got our new van. We got a boat. Um, for those of you old enough to remember Paladin, we had multi-beam and we were ready to travel. <laughs> so now finally we were set up to do exactly the kind of stuff that California needed. The other thing that I did with that million bucks is I wanted to create a strategic plan for how California should move ahead with mapping its seafloor. And what I, I, I learned early on as a graduate student that whoever gets a plan down on paper first is the one who gets to set the agenda. And, and if you can get a strategic plan in place that's been vetted and involved all the relevant stakeholders, that plan is going to have weight. And so I used about 50K of that money, and I talked Noah um, into getting involved to facilitate a workshop where we brought in representatives from 85 different agencies up and down the West Coast to talk about why do you want to do seafloor mapping and exactly where it ought to be done on the California coast. And so we ended up with a prioritized map, um, and that's what those colored blocks are. Everyone at the, agenda, at the meeting got to vote for where they would want to do the mapping, and they gave a reason for why it would be done and what the data would be used for. So I had this color-coded priority map of where things ought to be done. Then there was a flurry of funding activity uh, both at state and federal levels where money for RFPs, request for proposals, were being put out to support ecosystem-based management um, that, were, that called for habitat mapping. Well, I had that map and I had the results of the workshop, and so we cleaned up. We got every single one of those RFPs to fund our work, and we ended up collecting data at all the strategically critical places along the California coast. So this sort of set the stage for the next phase, and we've been moving ourselves from this to that. So now I had examples um, of what could be done, and now uh, situations where those data were actually being used to advance ecosystem-based management and seafloor landscape ecology. And we started using those to publish papers. One of the first things we did is we went out and we mapped the headward part of Monterey Submarine Canyon. No one had done that before. Uh, we found these incredible features uh, in the seafloor. We also were able to do serial mapping, time series mapping, and so we could quantify where sediment was accumulating and eroding. So we could not only get a pattern, we could also get process and rates. Uh, this led to a number of papers I published with our geologist, um, Doug Smith, uh, that are now sort of um, uh, primary papers in submarine cane and geomorphology and, and process. <coughs> Also went to the Elkhorn Slough. I showed you sort of those high maintenance ways of quantifying erosion and tidal scour. Uh, with multi beam, we mapped the whole slough. And we could do subtractions uh, of the data sets there. And we could quantify very precisely down to centimeters per year of rates of erosion in the Elkhorn Slough. Uh, we did a lot of mapping of habitat around Monterey Peninsula and even uh, helped the, uh, the Coast Guard and the steamship companies picked uh, environmentally uh, sensitive areas to be avoided when the cruise ships were coming through and dropping their anchors. So in 99, again, with that Marine Life Protection Act, uh, it also required that the state of California implement uh, a network of marine protected areas. And this is to be the nation's largest network of MPAs and I took this on as a personal crusade to move the state to find the political will 
to create a set of terrain maps for the whole continental shelf of California, just like we have for the terrestrial environment, but uh, we're trying to do it for the sea floor because I knew from my own research and what I was seeing other people do that if you didn't have that kind of data, it was going to be tough to put that, those NPAs in place. So in 2004, our governor, remember Arnold? He took aim at ocean health. He, because the, the MLPA, which was supposed to uh, set up these marine protected areas, ran off the tracks twice. It just didn't work. They couldn't get any traction there. It wasn't happening. The governor says, it will happen. Okay? So he put his ocean action strategy together. It was all about action. Um, and he uh, reauthorized the MLPA and said, you will do this. So, so the third time around. But even then, most people, when they think of marine habitats, they think of the big blue area on the map. Okay? When in fact, it's just as complex as our terrestrial habitats um, in terms of topographic complexity, et cetera. And it's that complexity that enables, to a large extent, the biological diversity that we have out there. Uh, but at the time that the MPAs were to be formed, the entire surface of Mars had been mapped in greater detail than the California state waters, that little strip between the shore and three miles offshore. So that's why my students were smiling, because they knew there was real opportunity here. Because that lack of data, while it was a problem, it was creating real career opportunities for them. And so, because if, if the marine environment were really this uniform, the NPA design would be easy. You would just go ahead and just randomly or re regularly place NPAs and control areas along the coast and you'd be done. But that's not what it looks like. Uh, in fact, if you were going to make reserves for deer, you wouldn't pick parking lots. Right? And if you're going to make reserves for rockfish, you're going to need to know where the rock is. And so that was the message that I took to the state as they were moving ahead with this. Um, and the rest of the state and the nation were coming out with all sorts of reports saying that habitat mapping is essential if you're going to really uh, implement ecosystem-based management. So people were finally getting on board with the need to get this mapping done. So who are you going to call to get it done like this? Of course, uh, it was going to be us. And in 2005, I got the call from the governor's office uh, with a request that I couldn't refuse, um, which was, Rick, we know you've been talking about seafloor mapping and, and getting all the state waters mapped. We're going to be putting a bond together. Uh, it's kind of like the Blues Brothers are putting the band back together. We're putting the bond together. Um, and would you write the scope of work in the budget for doing the seafloor mapping for the whole state? And it took me about two seconds to say yes to that. Um, and so we got an $84 million bond passed, and of which we had about $24 million earmarked for the state mapping project. And so we were off to the races. We formed the, um, the California Seafloor Mapping Project. We're going to use multi beam sonar, um, and uh, we're going to try out airborne bathymetric LIDAR to see how well that worked on our coast as well. And so from 2005 to 2012, uh, we ran that program. We completed the data acquisition for the mainland coast uh, this past year. It was a public-private partnership. I put a team together of agencies, private industry, and then academics. Of course, I was the academic because our lab to do that. Um, and the objective was comprehensive mapping of all the state waters along 1,300 kilometers of coastline with the goal is a seamless, comprehensive, high-resolution land uh, map across the land sea margin um, that was going to characterize the coastal geophysical patterns um, and processes. So the way we did it, it's fairly straightforward. You pick the area that you're going to map, you lay out your track lines, you get the appropriate vessel, appropriately equipped, put your eager students on it, and you go out and you mow the lawn. Go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and from that, you end up with billions and billions of depth samples. And that's what you use your students for, is they go through and they clean out the bad data points. And from that, you can produce a digital elevation model, a DEM, which is a gridded data set uh, generally for the state waters. It's, uh, each depth sounding was uh, about every two meters. And from that, 
you can produce a variety of derivative products, such as the shade of relief, that anyone, the public in particular, can interpret. They can see where the rock is, they can see where the sediment was. This revolutionized how the public um, was able to participate in designing the marine protected areas, because they could see where the rocky habitat was, where the sediment was. But the cool thing about digital elevation models is you can do all sorts of landscape ecology algorithmic analysis on them. Uh, for instance, the Marine Life Protection Act had a very simple classification scheme written in the law. It was based on depth and substrate type, rock versus sediment. And so we could very quickly generate the depth zones that were specified in the act, and we could generate a rock versus sediment map by using a tool called rugosity. It just finds the rough part of the seafloor versus the smooth part, and you could use that as a proxy for rock versus sediment. You can combine those two together and produce very quickly the habitat map that was required for the NLPA Act, which shows rock versus sediment within the different depth zones. And that's what was needed for them to go ahead and, and um, define where the MPAs were to be found. In addition to the shaded relief, uh, shown here, we also collected what's known as backscatter. That's the intensity of the echo that comes back from the sea floor. And as you know, sound, when it bounces off a hard surface, comes back with a lot more energy. When it bounces off a soft surface, less energy. And so you're able to tell where the soft echo return is, is generally softer sediment. The darker areas are coarser sediment. And so you can tell a fair amount just about grain size uh, from those two data sets. In addition, we also did sub-bottom profiling that the U.S. Geological Survey took the, the lion's share of the work in. Sub-bottom profiling, and here you see uh, the, the larger image is the shaded relief image of the sea floor. And sub-bottom profiling is kind of like a road cut. It slices down through the bottom of sound so you can see the different strata, uh, rock and sediment, uh, below the surface. And we also did ground truthing, video ground truthing, where we take tow sleds, video tow sleds with still cameras and video cameras on them, and pick transects across our uh, multi-beam data, and then take pictures and videos uh, as it went to quantify biological patterns. So has the uh, California Seafloor Mapping Project been a good investment? Well, let's look at it from a number of perspectives. Um, this is. Uh, an area known as Mavericks in California. It's a big surface site, big waves, 60 foot waves formed there during certain times of the year. And this is a picture of the geology just offshore of it. And for the first time, it was really clear why that big wave would break where it did. When I produced this image, within 24 hours, it had gone viral. It was all over Washington. I was getting calls from, from NOAA and everywhere. Um, and it made the front pages of uh, California newspapers. Uh, we got the cover of Sea Technology Magazine. It was featured in the New York Times. We were on PBS, it is specialized. Um, and so public media sort of liked it because it gave a view of the ocean happened before. But for me, one of the biggest successes of the program was I involved a lot of undergraduate students in this project. They were trained in state-of-the-art technology, not only how to collect and process the data, but as importantly, they knew its strengths, its weaknesses, its capabilities. This is the GIS team that worked for California's Department of Fish and Game in the Marine Region. They're all undergraduate students that came out of my lab that they hired to work on the data that we produced to generate all the products that Fish and Game now uses to manage the MLPA. So it was by training undergraduates in that project process that we developed a workforce that the state needed to actually move ahead in the evolution of how they were managing the seafloor to take advantage of all that new technology and the new data. So what's happening with all the data? Uh, one thing we're doing is we've got the whole coast divided into about 85 blocks, and we're producing a set of folio maps for each one of those blocks. The USGS is taking the lead in that. And each one of those blocks will have a suite of about 10 or 15 uh, different kinds of maps showing the geology, the habitat, uh, sub-bottom profiling, et cetera. These are going to take years to produce. I mean. I'll probably be dead before they're all out. Uh, but they'll be great whenever they're out there. Um, what I found more interesting, uh, or at least uh, more immediate, was we, we hooked up with Google Earth, with Google Earth early on, to incorporate 
all of our terrain data into their globe. And so when we finish a particular patch of real estate, we ship it to Google Earth and they build it into their globe. Uh, and so now if you go to the California coast and zoom in on Google Earth, you'll see all this high resolution data on the seafloor. And of course our institution is, is accredited there. Um, and so it's out there for the public to see. We also have all the data available on our website. So if you go to seafloor.csub.edu, you can go to um, the CSMP mapping project. Um, and there's a data catalog there. You can click on that. It takes you to the map with lots of little squares on it. You can pick on any one of those squares. And a little pop-up menu shows up with all the different derivative products we've generated for each one of those locations. Among those are KMZ files that you can open up. And if you've got Google Earth running on your computer, uh, it'll drop those right on top of your computer, and they're even better than the maps that Google Earth has in them. And so now you can see incredible detail uh, right before your eyes, and this is what we use, and USGS uses, and a lot of other people all the time to view the data that we have for the whole state coast in Google Earth. And it, you, you get there in seconds. So it's really uh, been a handy tool. We've also made a bunch of useful discoveries. Um, one of the reasons that the mapping project went ahead in California was uh, you probably heard, we do tend to have earthquakes out there, um, and one of the concerns that we have uh, is the proximity um, uh, to the shore and coastal development of offshore fault lines and where they come on shore, both because they can be earthquakes and because they can generate tsunamis. And we're now able to see fault lines very clearly um, in, uh, in the bathymetry that we can see. And here, and, and one of the things that you, they try and do is to calculate the rate of slippage. Like, when was the last time that fault moved to give some indication as to whether or not it's active? And what you can see right here is the offset of these features. You can see this feature comes along here and then it's displaced here. So this, when this crack last slipped, it shifted those. And so if you can age this long vertical feature, then you have an idea of when that earthquake may have moved last. And one of the ways you age it is using Paleo River channels. Here you can see this meandering channel cut through the rock, which lines up with the stream. So at a low stand, the last low stand of sea level, uh, this river cut um, that channel in the rock. And so that gives them a way to age um, exactly uh, those features. And then if you line those up with certain faults, you can figure out when those faults last move. Uh, tsunami hazards is another uh, real concern along our coast, um, and we found some big ones. Uh, this is off the Santa Barbara Channel. This is the Continental Shelf Edge here. These huge landslide toes, they run out 8 to 10 miles offshore. They're just colossal um, landslides. And when one of those things trigger, if they trigger all at once, they can produce a considerable landslide. Um, an example, another one that we found uh, that sort of gets at one of the questions that we have was right here off of Port Wainiti in Southern California where the Sudbury Canyon comes in. If we zoom in on that and look right there, you can see there's some old landslide scars along the face of the canyon, but right here you can see this crack right along the edge of the wall. And it's like a big block of sediment that's cracked loose and it's dropped a little bit, but it's just hanging there. And the question is, is it all going to come down at once, or is it just going to dribble down? Because up until now, the folks that model tsunami, tsunamogenic landslides, like when they, they see a scar like this, and they make the assumption that, OK, that was a landslide of this volume. It all occurred at once. It would have produced a tsunami of this size. But if what's really happening is, and you can see it right here, if little bits of this big block are coming down, sort of dribbling down a piece at a time, it's not going to be one big pulse of sediment, and it probably won't produce a tsunami at all. And so by following these over time, we can get a much more realistic assessment of how these landslide scars are forming, whether they're large pulses or whether they uh, occur over time. Um, we're also seeing a lot of uh, marine archaeological sites. There are 1,500 known shipwrecks uh, that have occurred along California, and our data has a lot of them in them. Um, in fact, I was preparing for a class one day to do something else entirely. They had this, this image up on the screen, 
and I sort of zoomed in on it, wasn't really paying attention until I looked up and saw what looked like this grain of rice on the snow. What, what was that? And, uh, it's 270 feet long, and it actually lines up with uh, a wreck that uh, hadn't been seen since it caught on fire off of the Santa Cruz Boardwalk Amusement Park um, back in 1927. And so we traced it down and figured out this had to be that wreck. Um, the mapping data is also being used to monitor seafloor uh, disturbance, uh, in some cases anthropogenic disturbance. And for those of you that are awake, you're looking at this picture and going, hey, that's not California, Philip. Um, it's true, it's not. That's the Antarctic. Uh, we were down there. This is our little survey boat right here. We were down our international expedition a few years ago. Um, this big piece of ice, it's an iceberg. It's grounded in a thousand feet of water. It's sitting on the sea floor. It's huge. Um, and we were down there um, quantifying benthic disturbance. And what you see here is a chunk of the sea floor in shade of relief, and it looks kind of like scar tissue. There's just gouges all over it. And those gouges, in many ways, are analogous to what happens to the sea floor when you use trawling gear for fish. Uh, these big boards uh, on the side of this boat, they hold the nets open, and they contact the bottom, and they gouge up the sea floor, and the tickler chain on the, on the net also gouges it up. And so an uh, issue of concern is, how much damage, how much disturbance is that doing to the seafloor? How often is the seafloor disturbed? What percentage of it is disturbed? Well, with, with a DEM like this, we can run a topographic position index algorithm over it to very quickly quantify what percentage of the bottom is disturbed, what percent is pushed up into sediment mounds, what percent is gouged out into pits. And we can generate statistics on that to show exactly what amount of the seafloor is like that. And so that same approach that we use with ice scour can also be used with trawling disturbance. So you can calculate how often a piece of real estate on the seafloor is disturbed by trawling here and whether or not you're exceeding some maximum level uh, that's good for the environment. We've also been discovering some ecologically important habitat types uh, that hadn't been considered before. Uh, in particular, uh, one that uh, I'm really focusing on in my own research called ripple scour depressions which you can see up here, they kind of look like hot rod flames all over the seafloor. If I show you the backscatter image, uh, they show up even better because the sediment inside of these ripple scour depressions is very coarse, much coarser grain size than the surrounding plateau. And those depressions are about uh, 20 to 40 centimeters below the surface of the rest of the continental shelf. And so they're actual depressions. And the, as I said, the sediment Outside is very fine, and inside is very coarse off with lots of little shell chips. And if we take a closer look at the multi beam imagery, you can see that they're all filled with ripple marks. These are ripple scour depressions with ripples. Here goes the name ripple scour depression. Okay, so when I first saw these things, uh, a lot of questions popped into my head. But the first one was are these things ecologically important? Because they've got to be, I would think because coarse grain sediment usually supports a very different fauna um, than fine grain sediment. And so to take a look at it, um, we're, I'm going to take you on a tour. Jocelyn, my undergraduate, is going to take this ROV. And we're going to run that ROV right across this interface, looking at the outside and the inside of the RSD to show you what they look like and what the biology looks like. And so first of all, we're going to take a look outside the RSV, and what you're seeing here, all these little fingers sticking up, those are brittle star arms. Brittle stars, in this case, are living below the sediment. They stick one arm up, or two, and they filter feed. They're suspension feeders. Um, the bottom was just covered with millions of those everywhere. Incredibly rich community, every place we look, outside of the RSDs. Now, if we go inside the RSDs, um, here you can see the, the big bed forms, these are the big ripple marks. And what's immediately obvious is there's no ophioroids there. And this is just a few meters away from where these guys were. As soon as you cross this boundary, the ophioroids disappear, and there's very, very few uh, uh, invertebrates. But what we found were these guys. These are young of the year rockfish uh, in incredible numbers, two orders of magnitude more abundant inside the RSDs than outside the RSDs. Completely unexpected. 
canary rockfish were actually one of the major species that that whole NPA network was formed was to help recover these fish. And yet we found them inside RSDs. So our guess is that these ripple scour depressions are nursery grounds for this critical species that everyone else assumed were living uh, uh, over rocks or up in the kelp forest. And we now found that these ripple scour depressions um, make up, uh, actually it's, it's over 5% of the California continental shelf, which is very close to the amount of shelf that's made up by rocky reefs. So they're almost as abundant as rocky reefs as the shelf. Uh, the shelf. Um, and in some of the areas, some of these marine protected areas, they represent over 30% of the habitat. The other thing that we've learned from this um, is that a single snapshot does not capture the ephemeral nature of some of these near shore habitats. So with the mapping that we did, we got one picture of where everything was, but if you go back over time and take another shot, these are surface models. These are three-dimensional surface models that we produce. You can go into GIS and subtract those and see where the differences have occurred. And so here, in this canyon head, we can see that the cooler colors are where sediment is accumulated. The warmer colors are where sediment has been lost. So we can actually see changes um, in erosion and deposition. Uh, we've also been able to find underwater landslides. This is a landslide that occurred. We mapped before and then after it occurred. And so we know exactly when it happened and how large it was. And we're able to watch it change over time. So we're now beginning to get at the dynamics associated with under underwater landslides, the, the rate of formation and the rate of healing. The other thing that we're finding is that rocky habitat doesn't always stay rocky habitat. Uh, we went out in 2007, shot this gray bathymetry, we went out in 2009 to finish it off in the gold colored bathymetry, and we had some overlap, our two data sets right in here. And what we found was that rocky habitat um, had been buried by up to two meters of sediment. So if we had just assumed that everything that looked like rock in 2007 was going to stay rock, we would have been wrong. Um, what we don't know is what happened to this rock because we haven't mapped out there yet. So it may well be that a lot of the habitat uh, gets covered and uncovered either seasonally or during major events. Um, which may have real implications for the performance of the marine protected areas because different species associate with rocky habitat, and if that amount of habitat is reduced, the number of species available may also decline. We also <coughs> had to um, uh, develop a number of technological improvements and innovations in order to succeed in this very challenging problem uh, in this project. One of the biggest challenges we had was what we call the white zone data gap. If you look at most multi-beam hydrographic surveys, you'll find that the data stops before you get to shore. There's this gap. There's a reason there's a gap there. If you take a boat in here, you die. Um, this is where it's really shallow water, breaking waves, um, and yet it leaves questions unanswered, like where does this fault line go? Is it going to go on shore? or does it turn and parallel the shore? You can't answer that until you can actually map that data. So we had to come up with a way to solve that. In some cases, uh, the white zone represented 6% of the uh, data within the, the shallow uh, MOPA zone. So it really was a critical gap, but it was obstacles of fog, rocky shoals, cloudy water, and filthy kelp that kept out these more traditional methods of mapping, airborne LIDAR, or conventional survey vessels. And so I built the kelp fly. Uh, this is a very unusual vessel. Uh, it's a 160 horsepower Yamaha jet ski mounted in an armored rib, so it's a real heavy duty aluminum hull, uh, so it can bounce off the of rocks. It's got about a hundred, oh, no, it's, got that. it's about, it's a half a million dollars worth of uh, instrumentation on this thing. Uh, so I can operate in the surf, uh, I can bump into rocks in really shallow water, and it does just fine. Um, it still had a problem with the kelp, though. When I took a jet into the kelp, it just sucked an intake and stopped it dead. And so I added an aircraft engine on the back. And so it's now an airboat. So when we get up close to the kelp, 
we turn off the jet and fire up the prop, it sounds like a Cessna, and we blow across the kelp and we can map right through it. So it's worked out extremely well. Um, it's also beach launchable. We spent uh, several weeks on San Nicolas Island uh, working for the Navy, getting all that mapped, and so we can roll it into the surf. But I have to have students that are highly skilled uh, and also coordinating outfits so they can help launch it. And I'll show you some of the results that we get from the kelp flight. We're going to go up to Point Lobos, uh, Whaler's Cove, near Monterey. This is what we were able to do before the kelp flight with our 34 foot uh, launch. We could get into about this far. This great data is ours. You can see why we didn't get into the cove. It's all full of kelp. You just can't run a boat in there. With the kelp fly, I could drive right on top of the kelp, completely fill it in. Moreover, I mount a laser scanner on it. There's a LIDAR system on it that looks sideways. And so I get the topographic data on the shoreline. So we get pretty much a seamless uh, bathymetry topography data set um, that uh, puts the whole coast together for us. And this has allowed us to go back into Elkhorn Slough and monitor uh, erosion in there at a much uh, higher resolution. Um, and remember the old school way, now with uh, the kelp fly and LIDAR, this I did in about an hour. Uh, this is LIDAR data going up the slough. These are all mud flats on the side, so you see the entire inner tidal. Um, and this is shot with a laser scanner about this far off the water's edge. And so with that and with the bathymetry, we now can keep track uh, of changes in the slough surface erosion deposition uh, down to better than a centimeter of change. You guys recognize this island? Alcatraz? Uh, anybody here been to San Francisco? So there's the Golden Gate Bridge. We shot this with a laser scanner up on the Ventresca. Um, we were able to get the whole shoreline, all the wash rocks, Alcatraz Island, Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, again, in just incredible detail, the same level of resolution we're getting the sonar um, to produce these seamless uh, land, sea, terrain models um, across that uh, the coastal interface. And so, we put this to work um, at some of the nuclear power plant sites in California. The Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant is going through the relicensure right now uh, because there's concern that tectonic activity fault lines running near it may present a threat. Um, and so PG&E, uh, the power company, had brought us down there a couple of years back to map out in front uh, using our conventional launch to look for fault lines. And indeed, we found the shoreline fault. So the shoreline fault runs right along here. Uh, that's the power plant right there. So there was some concern. But what they wanted to know was, but were there any branches that came off and ran under uh, the plant? And you just can't get in here with a conventional launch. So this was a, another, you got to be kidding for everyone when I told them, yeah, I can map it. But we brought the kelp fly down. They brought their crane in, lifted it up. We put it in the water. Um, nuclear power plants are really high security areas. Like when you try and get into them, you're met with people with really big automatic weapons, asking all kinds of questions. PG&E had invited me to come down to do this. The engineers knew I was coming. The, uh, the contractors knew I was coming. The biologists knew I was coming. The only people that didn't know I was coming People with the big guns. <laughs> so these are their own people helping me launch the boat. We get it in the water. I'm doing just fine. And unbeknownst to me, as I pull into the cove, and this, this is all the data that I collected. This is called uh, Discharge Cove. These are the nuclear domes. As I brought the kelp fly around and drove in here, I found out later that all the walkie-talkies started crackling with the guys with the guns going, there's a jet ski coming into Discharge Cove. Unwrap this 50 calibers. They were taking the covers off the 50 caliber machine guns that they had posted all along here. They were getting ready to shoot me. Um, fortunately, one of the security guards that I had met at the gate coming in knew that I was supposed to be there. He said, he got on the race, no, no, don't shoot him. He's one of ours. So uh, I survived. Um, I didn't know about any of this until I got back to shore and they greeted me. And, uh, so it was exciting. Um, but uh, they said, next time, 
And the funny thing was, as I was driving into the power plant, towing this behind me, there's this whole set of signs talking about the importance of, community, of communication to safe nuclear plant operation. <laughs> There's the irony for you. Anyway, the bottom line is, we used the kelp fly. We completely filled in everything right up to the shore uh, so that they could see where these other fault lines were. Worked out great for everybody. Um, but for me, what was cool is that not only can we see the bottom, but I'm a benthic ecologist. I really worry about the biology. That's why I got into this whole thing. So we can see all this, this habitat, but what about the biology? Um, we've got all that kelp, and we've got all these fish. What can we do with the sonar to help us quantify and visualize those? Well, we do a lot. We take this little patch of real estate here, and then view it in 3D. All these blue streamers coming up, that's the kelp in the water column. And I was able to go back over time and actually follow individual kelp plants and how they grew over time. So we can now actually quantify kelp biomass and growth rates over time. Couldn't do that before. The best we've been able to do now is using aerial photography or satellite imagery to estimate kelp cover with just what's lying on the surface. If it wasn't on the surface, you're out of luck. Now we can see it right at the bottom and growing all the way up. And it's really helped us a lot. This is the work we just did this summer for the Navy out at San Nicolas Island. Uh, this, all the yellow here around San Nicolas is the aggregate cover of all aerial surveys of kelp ever done around San Nicolas. In other words, it shows the maximal aerial extent of what they thought kelp forests could be. We took our sonar data and looked at the aerial extent of kelp based on what we saw in the water column, and that's the red, which indicates that there's twice as much kelp forest habitat out there as we previously thought, and that was just done in one two-week survey. But what about all the fish? We're getting close to the end here. Um, with fish, it's trickier to map. Um, we did a lot of mapping using ROVs, where we would take our ROV as acoustic tracking on it so we can see where it is, and then we would run these lines across um, our maps, and we would count all the fish. Every single fish we saw, we would know what species it was, what size it was, and we'd get its location, and then we could have this map of fish aggregations. Um, and this is what the, the data looks like when we're cruising along. And then we could take various derivatives of the bathymetry. Um, we could get depth. We could get slope analysis. We could get rugosity, which is that roughness thing. Uh, we could get topographic position index, et cetera. And use that with all the fish position data. And we could produce distribution maps of the fish. We could predict where we would expect to see fish over this whole map. And the accuracy of those maps was we were getting up between 85 and 95 percent accurate. So it was working out really well. Um, and the, the idea is that you get all these different layers of habitat we derive from the bathymetry. And then for every fish that we see, we can get a value of each one of these derivative layers, then use green geospatial modeling tools to generate a distribution map of that species. And then from that, we can get abundance estimates for how many fish are likely to be, in this case, in the marine protected area. Um, and it comes, it's a much more accurate method than anything we've come up with before. Oh, there's no audio. Sorry, Clint's saying a man's got to know his limitations. But the point being is napping with a video uh, on an ROV is, it's okay, it was just one clip, but okay. Um, is really labor intensive, and you're only getting data along those track lines that you're running. You don't get all the fish. So what I'm going to show you now is what we can do with sonar on fish. We're going to go visit this little rocky outcrop right here. And now we can use our sonar to not only get the bottom, but we can see the fish in the water column. What you're seeing here is a 3D cloud of fish uh, right in the water column. And so we can see exactly where the fish are, uh, what part of the rock they, they uh, are associated with um, through the size of the cloud. We can't get the number of individual fish yet, but we can get the, uh, the size of the school. Uh, and so the questions that we're trying to answer now is, what is the per unit area uh, value of habitat of isolated rocks versus these continuous rocky reefs? Because what we're seeing is 
rocks are, are all by themselves like this one and this one seem to have a whole lot more fish on them than the same patch size inside of a continuous reef. Um, and so now using sonar we can get the fish distribution and the habitat distribution and come up with much better models of where the populations tend to be and their distribution. So we started with my fledgling career looking at the seafloor sort of one square meter at a time. Ending up still being able to see one square meter at a time, but all of those one square meters at once, uh, and maintaining that high resolution over very broad landscapes. And that's kind of the future of marine uh, landscape ecology. In fact, with these sorts of data and tools, it actually surpasses what you can do with terrestrial ecology because you got all this biology out there hiding, you got trees and everything. Uh, we can get through it with all this. So it's a brave new world for, um, for marine biology and marine ecology, uh, especially as we bring other data sets in. We can bring in coastal currents. Uh, we can bring in uh, all sorts of seafloor imagery uh, and, and georeferenced biological data. Uh, these are just examples. Uh, Barbara Block's program, so you've heard of Barbara Block's, the TOPS program, where she's actually tracking uh, critters across the ocean. You can bring in that position data. Wave models, wave energy models you can bring in, um, satellite imagery and weather. Anything that has a geospatial component that's place-based, you can bring in uh, to this eco-forecasting landscape uh, modeling and to create, ultimately, um, models where, I don't know if you can see these little arrows. But this is an oceanographic current model displayed on top of the seafloor maps. So the whole idea is ecosystem visualization and eco-forecasting where we can see pattern and process playing out on landscapes and begin to model those relationships. And I will end it there and be happy to take any questions. I think I ran a couple minutes over, but thanks for your attention. strategic planning meeting, what was uh, defining it there was different agencies had different institutional mandates. They had certain areas they were particularly interested in in terms of the fisheries they had to manage uh, or um, uh, habitat impacts. Um, and, and so uh, and some uh, were like for mm -hmm. offshore energy siting. Um, and so they had specific questions they wanted answered that could only be answered with information from that sort of mapping. And the way we actually ran the workshop is I gave every participant 10 sticky dots. And there was a grid of California's offshore waters. And they could then put those dots wherever they wanted. They could put one dot on each of 10 different squares, so they could stack all 10 of them up on one square. And then we counted all those dots up. And they, and they coded those dots with their agency name and their number. And then they also gave us a worksheet stating why they picked a spot, what they used the data for, what project, et cetera. So we collected all that information, all of which is online. And that's what really set it up for us when, we, when Sea Grant, the EPA, and, and other agencies came out with funding opportunities uh, for mapping. We had this whole body of knowledge, all these agencies that had said, yes, we want it done here for these reasons. This is what we're going to do with it. And this is who it's going to help. Uh, so we really let the stakeholders drive that. Yes. Um, so, a lot of that's super, super neat, fascinating to look at, and amazing to imagine the uh, implications for these data collection, analysis, etc. Um, but I suppose the main goal, originally the main goal, especially for the, the mapping project uh, of the coastline of California, was to establish these habitat protection areas. So the main goal is to protect the bioethic, right? And the ecosystems. That was the driving force that pushed the state to fund it. Yeah. Yes. Has um, that have you seen any protection or Oh well yeah, the MPAs well, I mean the brain protect areas are in place. That network is now in place. 
Uh, and so what, what's happening now is also in that law is the requirement that at five years from formation, the MPAs have to have their performance evaluated. And so the next step was to do a biological assessment baseline study. And so they used our mapping data to design where they would go and do their assessment. So they made sure that they were doing adequate sampling in all the different habitat types. Without these maps, all you were doing is what I used to do is jump in the water and hope for the best. Uh, now they could say, okay, we got a sample here, 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 and here, and they would go and do that. The other thing that they're doing um, is with those baseline biological data, using the geospatial uh, landscape modeling that I showed you there, they can now make quantitative estimates of species abundance and distribution in those MPAs. And then five years from now, they're gonna be able to go back and do that again. So the, the short answer to your question is yes, and without the mapping data, they couldn't have done any of that. But like, so in five years, they're gonna be able to see if there has been an improvement? They will ask the question, has there been a change? Whether or not there has been a change is another question, is, 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 a, is an open question. But they have inside and outside of the MPA. So there's the marine protected areas that are protected where fishing is reduced or eliminated. And then there's adjacent areas. And that's the other critical part of the mapping is if you're going to have a control site, for it to be a valid control, it needs to be sufficiently similar to the other site. If you don't have decent habitat data, you don't know how similar the area that you picked is. And so this way, uh, the colleagues that I'm working with are using our data extensively to, to pick both the control area and the treatment area, and then to pick exactly where they're sampling and keeping track of that. So it, it's, it's, it's what's working. Uh, the sad part is, when I first saw this kind of data as a Bentham College, I was like, oh my god, yes, this is, this is it. This is exactly what I need. That's why I went crazy getting all the equipment. A lot of Bentham Ecologists are still in the, let's put a mask on and go look, which is great to do, but they're not keeping track of where they're looking. They jump in the water, they count some fish, they come back up, they're right down that, but they don't know exactly where it is, so you can't really tie it to the habitat. And so what we're working on now is teaching them how they can put acoustic trackers on their divers and actually keep track of where their divers are or their ROVs or their sleds and all that. So it's coming along, but we're way behind Tasmania, Australia, uh, the European Union, uh, Norway, um, those folks got a long time ago and we figured out that that's, that's important. So we're, we're still playing catch up. So they have their hand up over here. Uh, how often do you take the images of a certain place? Because oh, I reminded that um, the trends that are going along with the beginning of the season or the time of the year. So that happens like, do you take several images of the same place? Per year, or yes. you're one? Well, you're getting at, at one of the basic questions that we're trying to answer, which is, <clears throat> yes, we know that the habitat changes, but when, under what circumstances, how often? And so what I really want to see, the next thing that I want to buy, <laughs> uh, and actually, I just, I, just got, I just got funding for one of them. Uh, just got $250,000 to get an autonomous vehicle um, so that I can just turn it loose and it goes out, does the survey, and comes back and gives me the data. And that's really what you need for something like this, is where like every week you just send it out, it collects the data, and it comes back. And you just do that over time. And then you correlate that with other environmental events to find out, okay, when do these events happen? What do they, and what are they correlated with? So that's, but that's, you know, we've got pattern, now we've got to get process and timing. Yes? Uh, do you think that more uh, commercial fishing operations will use the uh, multi-beam sonar to exploit uh, different schools of fish? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they are. Um, and in fact, when I first got into this, when I first saw those data, I realized, oh man, if people can see this, they can see where every last scrap of habitat is to fish. And all they need is a GPS unit, and they can go out and fish it. And we know that on some of those remote rocks, as I've seen them, you have big rockfish. You know how old a mature rockfish can be? 250 years old, 400 years old. And they can be fished out in a day. 
And it's those big ones, those big old ones, they're the major contributors to the reproductive effort of the population. And so before I ever started mapping, when I got the money from Fish and Game, I said, I'll do this, and I'll make the data available to you, and we'll make it publicly available, but you guys have to get out in front of it because you have to leave and envision how you're going to manage our resources with this level of information available to the public. Because California management, and it's true for most resource management agencies around the country, were originally based on managing abundance. We had so many fish in California in the 1800s that nobody really cared. I mean, you couldn't possibly catch them all. Plus, they were all invisible. It was the big blue area on the map. There was, the ocean was opaque enough that there was plenty of places for fish to hide. That's not the case anymore, and the fish have been knocked way down. And so this is why they're going to MPAs. Um, but uh, it's absolutely true. The orange roughy fishery is a classic example. Fishermen use multi-beam sonar to go out and find offshore mountains, which is where the orange roughy live. I don't know if you get orange roughy was a delicious fish. It used to be really common in the stores. You don't see it so much anymore because they got fished down. They could find all these offshore sea mounts with multi-beam. Then they go and they put these nets down. They just drag up the whole side of the sea mount, which not only caught all the fish, it also broke down all the coral. And if you think rockfish are old when they're big, coral is hundreds and hundreds of years old. Just all got knocked down um, in, in, uh, in Canada, the Maritimes. They started using multi-beam out there um, to uh, look at the habitat to help fishermen uh, understand where they should and shouldn't drag their nets so they wouldn't get hung up. The fishermen pretty much knew that. They knew where they shouldn't fish because it caught their nets. This was for scallop dragging. Um, as soon as they got those multi-beam maps, they're going, oh, that's why we couldn't drag our net there. But if we come in this way, then we can get that last little bit um, that we couldn't get before. And I don't mean to vilify fishermen. You know, they're just trying to make a living like everybody else. Uh, but we have to work everyone together realizing you can't take the earth down to bare metal. There won't be anything left. So, and that's why the MLPA in California is working pretty well, um, all things considered, because the fishermen were involved with the public and the agencies and the scientists in setting up to begin with. So our, we, we hope for the best. One more question? No more questions? Oh, one more question. There we go. Um, I have probably a different question than most people here, but I heard you say in the beginning that you were a kindergarten teacher. It's true. And I'm just so curious about, you know, what your training was before kindergarten and then landing into being a medicologist and having the floor. You know, it seems like you just went right into one thing, but were you trained before being a kindergarten teacher? Were you already a scientist? Well, I got my undergraduate degree in zoology. Um, and then when I graduated, this, a lot of us found if you got a BS in zoology, there weren't a lot of jobs for people BS in zoology out there. Uh, and I really wanted to do marine science anyway. Um, but I had a chance to go and um, teach English at a social center in Tijuana for a year. And I went down there and did that. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and so when I came back to, to Michigan, uh, a friend of mine was working at a, at a school. And I was really taken with teaching. It was just a whole lot of fun. Um, and so I, I got into that, enjoyed it. When I moved to California, um, I had been, um, the reason I came to California was to buy a boat. I was going to buy a, a sailing boat and spend two years sailing it down the coast because I had hired on as a teacher, an elementary teacher, to work on a two year around the world bargain team cruise uh, that didn't happen, but I still wanted it to happen. So I ended up in San Francisco uh, with the money left over from that cruise and uh, was a hang gliding bone for a year. Um, and that's when I started teaching kindergartens, because I figured, well, I've got to get a job. Let's, let's, I like teaching. I'll try kindergarten. And it was the best thing I ever did. Three years teaching kindergarten, and I ended up being the headmaster of the private school that I was in. Um, it was just a kid. So yeah, it's, it's been a, a secure discourse, but they, they, they were all linked together. All right, let's well, thank, thank you all. one more time.